Good morning, Moro Gospel Church. Stay safe. Hi. <sighs> Hello. Welcome here, everybody. Good morning, church. Blessings to you from us. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Morrow Gospel Church. Good morning, Church. Good morning, everyone. Wishing you peace, joy, happiness. It's good to see you. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. God bless Enjoy the you. service. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church. And Merry Christmas and many blessings for 2021. Good morning. My name is Steve, and you happen to be watching the live stream of Moral Gospel Church. All right, I'll start with the responsive reading. May the light of God's love push back the darkness. We come to the light from the four corners of the earth, from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west. We come from many nations and many cultures, but we are all one in Jesus Christ. We come seeking the light that guides us to life, but we are all one in Jesus Christ. Let us lift up our many voices and praise the God of all people.
God called us to live in the light and to walk as people of the light. But on this Epiphany Sunday, we come before the Lord in a prayer to confess that we still walk in darkness. We make personal decisions that drive us into the darkness. Our world is one filled with darkness, brokenness, and despair. We are deeply in need of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, to enter in and shine on us. The light of God shines in the darkness. God is calling the whole world together in unity to walk in the light as beloved and chosen people. Open your hearts to God's light and to one another. Thanks be to God. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a, ru for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship. Good morning, Mara Gospel Church. What a delight it was to join together uh, online, but to uh, celebrate Christmas Eve together. And uh, Paul Epp and the team, Leroy and Lisa, did such a good job. And a special thank you to all those that participated in the readings, uh, helping with the songs. Uh, we had such good attendance online for that service, uh, and many have watched it since uh, Christmas Eve as well. And so thank you for that great participation. And we made it through Christmas Day. In the midst of all the restrictions of the pandemic, as I've been chatting with people, I've heard many stories of creativity, uh, learning uh, to share meals together with children and grandchildren. Uh, many trips around the city were made delivering some special items. Uh, some of us had the chance to share Christmas lunch, uh, not with people in our home, but maybe on a Zoom or another mechanism, and so being able to connect and encourage each other. So. We have made it through our Christmas day, and now is the 27th, and we march to finish the year well, and then to enter a new year. Uh, later this week, I guess it is. 
Uh, and so this is our last Sunday in 2020. Let me just say a word of prayer before we begin our sermon time. Our great God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Some of us dreaded Christmas this year, and especially Christmas Day. But you have sustained us, and you have again brought meaning and hope in this season. And so we are grateful people. And I pray even for our learning time this morning in our worship service. Would you meet us here in the word and in the spirit? In the name of Jesus, amen. For many years, Arlene and I enjoyed listening to Stuart McLean and the Vinyl Cafe. And often we enjoyed listening to these stories during Sunday lunch. The Vinyl Cafe, I wish you were here so that I could see whether you connect with that or not, but the Vinyl Cafe stories are about Dave, an owner of a second-hand record store called the Vinyl Cafe. The stories also feature Dave's wife, Morley, their two children, Sam and Stephanie, and an assortment of friends and neighbors. They're fascinating stories. Stuart, the storyteller, passed away in 2017. Uh, But CBC has made the recordings available as podcasts. And occasionally, on Sunday mornings or Sunday over lunch, Arlene and I will still enjoy listening to the stories and hear some of the stories again and again. A few Sundays ago, we listened to an episode in which Dave, the main character, needs to make a special delivery. I won't tell you what the delivery is, but it's a two-day delivery, and he invites his son, Sam, to come with him on this two-day trip. Sam is interested, but then hesitates and replies that he can't. When Dave wonders why he can't, Sam stammers out something along the line of, His friends, which he then names, may plan something, and they might invite him. As Stuart said that, I marveled at how accurately that statement by Sam portrays the hesitancy, the hesitancy we have, especially as young adults, in making commitments. My friends... They might plan something, and they might invite me, and so I can't commit. We fear missing out on something that might come up, and so we don't commit to the opportunity that is right before us. In our text this morning, Matthew intentionally contrasts three ways in which people respond to the miracle of Christmas. Admittedly, the account as recorded by Matthew contains just enough details to raise many questions for which we can't seem to find answers. The questions are significant enough that we might dismiss it as a legend, except As so many other things in the gospel accounts, its very presence in the story attests to its legitimacy. Let me say what I mean by that. Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience. And right in the beginning of the Christ story, he involves these, well, they weren't really insiders at all. And our Bibles, the NLT, refers to wise men, but if you look at the footnotes, at the bottom it will say, or royal astrologers, the Greek reads magi. Wise men is a little bit easier for us to take. But these were people not from Jerusalem or Judea or Bethlehem, but they were outsiders 
far outsiders, like from the East, a very different race of people possibly, and also stargazers, magicians, not the kind of people that you would expect to find in a Jewish story about a Jewish Messiah. So, as so many others, uh, its inclusion almost gives the story the legitimacy. It must be true. And listening to the story, who would have told Matthew? Could it have been Mary? Maybe some others that had the chance to meet these strangers. But that must have been intriguing for Matthew, enough that he felt that it was important to include it in his account. And I will tackle a few of the easier questions this morning and seek to draw a life application or two for us to ponder. I'll start with the main characters in the story, the wise men. Who were they? In Western traditions, we speak of them as three. In Eastern tradition, the number is 12. It was probably way more than three. It was probably a whole caravan. And they must have come from Babylon or Persia. I've already told you what they might have been, what their profession, their religion might have been. How is it that these foreigners would know about a Jewish king to be born? Well, if they were from Babylon, which is possible, then you will remember from the stories in the Older Testament that hundreds of years earlier, a large group of Jewish people, especially young, promising people, had been taken there as captives. Among them were Daniel and his three friends. And if you remember this story, they became high-ranking advisors, wise men, in the palace courts. And so it's very possible that they would have included the Old Testament prophecies in their teaching and placed these in the palace resources. So maybe that's who they were, and that's how they would have been thoughtful. I'd like to draw four observations about these stargazers. Four, starting number one. They had been waiting and watching the stars for a sign that a new king was born. They had been waiting and watching the stars, the planets, for a sign that a new king was born. Secondly, once they saw what they perceived to be the sign, they set out on a lengthy journey with significant costs, carrying valuable gifts. Third, they made inquiries and kept following the star until they found the king that they were seeking. And fourth, and maybe most importantly, they worshipped him. Four significant notes about these wise men. In hindsight, from our vantage point, all of it makes perfect sense. These wise men made commitments and took action because they didn't want to miss out. But that's from our vantage point. When these stargazers showed up at, King's Herod's, at King Herod's palace, King Herod was alarmed enough that he wanted to know more. But it seems that he wasn't committed enough to take immediate action. The instructions that he gave these men was, go try to find him. And if and when you find him, let me know so that I can pay my dues as well. You go, and if you find him, then I'll come later. That sounds kind of typical, doesn't it? He could have easily sent along a group of soldiers, or at least a representative. 
He could have freed up his calendar. He's the king, Herod. He could have freed up his calendar and and accompanied these wise men himself. Gone to Bethlehem. But he chose the maybe later option. King Herod was interested and scared enough that he called two meetings, the text says. The first was with the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. I note that the text very very clearly says the leading priests. These weren't kind of peripheral ones that might have not known or that might have, we wouldn't have high expectations of. These were leading priests and teachers of religious law. The account suggests that they were able to put two and two together immediately in Bethlehem. That is where the Messiah will be born. That's what the scriptures say. The astounding fact that I believe Matthew wants us to catch is this. There is no record of them checking out this possibility themselves. No hint of any interest in doing so. Every day in their prayers, these men would have repeated words about their deep longing for the Messiah to come. Every day in their prayers, these leading priests these religious teachers would have had in their prayers a longing about the Messiah to come. And yet, when there's these men that come and ask and say, we have seen his star, he must be born, they are either too busy, too cautious, too skeptical, too afraid to miss out on something else, that they can't be bothered to travel the six measly miles to check it out for themselves. They entrust that sacred mission to some magicians from the East. Three very different responses to the possibility that the king of the Jews was born. The Messiah, the one that would shepherd his people. Now, as I said before, there are some questions to how all of this would have been. Were they planets that were aligning in a certain way? Was it a special star? And how is it that a star goes? How is it that a star from the east leads people to the west or to the south? There are many questions in this account and in some of the other accounts that we wrestle with. But we have been given enough to take informed, reasonable steps towards examining Jesus as the one sent by God, the Savior. So now I have three questions for us this morning. Will we be wise enough to commit to the journey? As we commit, we will discover more answers. Will we be wise enough to commit to the journey? As we commit, we will discover more answers. Secondly, will we continue, or maybe not secondly, but or, will we continue to unwisely postpone a commitment because we aren't quite convinced? Will you continue to unwisely postpone a commitment because you aren't quite convinced? Or 
do we foolishly point others in the right direction while remaining uncommitted and unchanged ourselves? Will you this Christmas season be wise enough to make the journey towards Bethlehem? to see for yourself whether this might be the one that the world has longed for and still many hope for. I promise you that as you begin and as you commit yourself to the journey, God is faithful and he will continue to give you more answers as you take that, those first steps. Let's not be unwise. Unwise and continue to postpone a commitment that we should be making because we aren't quite convinced or can't be bothered or wish or anticipate that something better will come. And mostly, and especially for all of us that have heard the good news, that have the scriptures, that have access to the gospel. Let us not foolishly point others to Jesus while remaining uncommitted and unchanged ourselves. There is no one or nothing coming that is better than Jesus, the light of the world. My personal testimony is that the best days of my life are the ones where I am walking towards Jesus and am close to him. My personal testimony are, is that the best days of my life are the ones where I am walking towards Jesus and am close beside him. The moments that I regret are the ones where I hesitate to follow or commit because I foolishly fear that I might miss out on something better. Remember that at one time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, we who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. A number of years ago, I was in Toronto, and I personally heard a lady share her testimony. And I came home, as I often do, and I told Arlene about the story. And Arlene remembers stories and the details of the stories better than I do. And so I've asked Arlene if she would come and share this story with us this morning that I had told her so many years ago. The story has to do with the text. When I teach this text in Life and Teachings of Jesus, I often tell this story. Uh, this woman and her family had come to the United States for medical treatment for one of their daughters. And they were far from home. Some of their family was left back in their home country. And the situation with their daughter didn't clear up as quickly as they had hoped. And so they were staying longer 
So they enrolled their youngest child in school, and she began to make friends. And one, one day, one of these friends invited her to come to church with them. And she asked her parents, and they agreed that would be okay. She could go with her friend. And on Sunday morning, the buzzer rang in their apartment, and the little girl was so excited to be going to church with her new friend that she just dashed out the door and jumped in the elevator. And the mother was going, oh, you can't just like leave like that, because any good mother knows they have to meet the people who are taking their child someplace. So she was kind of alarmed by this and dashed after her, but had to get in the next elevator to go down. And she was you know, just all the stress of being in a strange place and not speaking English well and her little daughter just taking off and her other daughter being so sick. And she was crying in the elevator and just feeling so shook up. And as she was going down the floors to the, to the lobby, a man in white appeared before her in the elevator and said to her, I am the good shepherd. And the, the elevator doors opened in the lobby and she stepped out and she was just kind of like, what did I just see? And she met the mother of the, her child's friend. And this woman noticed, well, you seem pretty shook up. Like, is, is everything okay? Is everything okay with your family? How is your daughter? And this woman was like, no, 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 like, and just kind of stammered out in her broken English, what it mean, I am the good shepherd. And this woman had the wisdom, as Herod should have, <laughs> to point to the scriptures and say, here, opened her Bible and read to her John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And, and shared that story with this woman. And that was the beginning, well, at least the beginning that she knew of her coming to faith in Jesus Christ and, and a transformation of their lives as a family. I always tell that story to my students to point out that God is speaking to people in places we don't expect. He was, he was pointing these Gentile astrologers to himself in a land where people would have thought, there's no, there's no witness to the Messiah there. And they, they paid attention, but they needed those who had the scriptures to point them the rest of the way. Um, so I don't know if I'm summing up Jake's message well enough, but that's how I'm telling the story. Thank you. Yeah, the, when I heard the, the lady talk about that story, it moved me deeply, just how big and how God, how big our God is and how gracious he is and how he will go through extraordinary means to draw people to himself. And he's at work in our world today. May we, those of us who have the scriptures, who are able to celebrate Christmas as the coming one, the one that came to save his people from their sins. May we be attentive to the Holy Spirit in our own lives and how God is working in the world around us so that when people come to our country, to our home, to us, when they ask the questions, may we be able to point him clearly to the one that is the hope, the light, the savior of the world. I've had a good morning this morning and I want to send you on with courage and joy. This week in our midweek, I'll share two songs with you that brighten my day today written by a pastor and the other one kind of produced and co-produced by the same pastor. But they are good songs that continue to drive home what we've talked about this morning. And so check your midweek and um, I think the songs will bring joy to your heart as well. So with that, I want to say thank you to all those that participated 
either this morning or in preparation for it, the worship teams, for those that made it possible through the technology. And I would like to send you on your way with this blessing. May God bless you. May God keep you. May the very face of God continue to shine on you and be gracious to you. May his very presence embrace you. And may he always be our peace. Amen. Now let us go. Let us renew our commitments to seek after Jesus, to walk close by his side, and to be the ones that are able to point others to the hope of the world. Let us go. Be light. Thank you for joining us for our weekly worship service. We trust that it has been a blessing to you. If there's anything else that we can do to help you in your spiritual journey, don't hesitate to contact us, either at the church office, 204-257-2500, or emailing us at info at moralgospel.org. Again, my name is Jacob Friesen, and I'm so glad that we've had this time together. May God bless you richly.